Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Punch, Kick, Choke, Chat. My name is Sean Benson. I'm one of your hosts. I'm coming to you 6.30 p.m. Calgary time, Mountain Time, and uh, I miss my home in Toronto right now, but I'm so happy to be out here working, and I'm so happy to be here for this show tonight. I uh, I have a job with Crazy Hours, and every time it works out for our Thursdays, I'm so grateful, and when it doesn't, I'm so grateful to our team. Tonight, we're here with Sensei Katie Murphy, and I want to start right out of the gate, Sensei Murphy. In the introduction, we're going to hear the incredible record this woman has. I mean, win, 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 just don't even get me going, accolades, competitor of the year, et cetera. So I do want to jump right into that without being too specific, because Sensei Dolphin may cover that. But Sensei Murphy, this is a question that's really simple. Having won so many championships, what do you think is the difference between your average martial artist, and we can break this to non-martial artists, your average person and a champion. Well, you know, this, uh, everything tonight, thank you so much for having me on. I'm so humbled to be invited all sure. of that aside. Uh, everything is perspective. So um, I, the difference between a champion who wins trophies and the difference between a champion who shows up every single night day in, day out, week in, week out, year out, um, it is just dedication. So you can have champions who go out uh, to tournaments and win trophies, and you can have champions who work hard every single night. To compete is a, um, for me, was a personal goal. Uh, that was something I wanted to do. I wanted to make meaning of my martial arts. In my early 20s, I was stuck. Uh, what am I doing with this? I, I made black belt. I got through... Um, but I felt I had a great sense of self-defense, great self-awareness. I was I was in shape. So why do I keep coming? And I needed a purpose, and that was competition. But I never, uh, I've always in my competition career have been humbled by there's always somebody out there better than you. They just didn't show up at that tournament. That wasn't their thing. And so um, I've never felt that people who compete are the only champions. I think there's a champion in every single one of us, and there's a champion in those folks. Uh, there were definitely people I've met in my martial, art career, martial arts career who never went to tournaments, that I could sit in the dojo and do line kata with them, and they did it better than me. And I would tap them on the shoulder and say, you know, you should come compete. No, that's not my thing. Ah. Like, I'm so humbled by that. So, you know, that's always been my take on it. Um, competition, championships. Uh, for me, it was personal. That was my little goal, my stepping stone. It's not for everybody. And uh, it means nothing in the big picture. So let me... Not to I, deflate anybody. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's just my opinion. Agreed. Well, I'm, you know, if we've met, it's only in passing. And I'm so already excited about this conversation because I just wrote down like five things I want to crack open. And we may not get to them all, but... The first thing I want to do is ask you to maybe put aside some of that humility and break down what it is you did do that maybe a version of you, if you don't want to even put yourself relative to others, wouldn't have done. And what what made you the champ versus somebody who didn't maybe place or somebody who didn't even compete? You know, what 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 did you specifically do? Well, you know, I, I had a drive. I had a goal. Um, and I, I got into the competition late in the game. I was in my 20s. I grew up in a um, a very large Irish family, and it was parents had money for karate, but not for tournaments. It was, well, you're going to go to class, but, oh, this extra money on these weekends, like, sorry, you're not doing it. So I, I did uh, save up enough money working as a teenager to go to a few little local events. And uh, in my early 20s, I decided, you know, I, this is going to be a, a little bit of a life goal for me. So I built that up for myself. What did I do? Um, I went to a few tournaments. And to be honest, I lost. I, I, I thought, oh, I do good kata. My sensei said I did do kata. I did good kata. And I did. And the dojo was good. It was fine. But on a competition piece, that sports martial arts piece was lost. That wasn't part of our dojo training. We were traditional goju karate and, and I love it. Um, but the sport piece was missing. So I observed, I watched, I looked at what they did and I um, figured out what I needed to do. And I went home and I trained and I was not in the position where I could be a dojo six, seven days a week. It was two nights a week but I was willing to dedicate the time every single morning, get up, stretch, kata, stance, work out, lift weights. 
And um, when I had a little bit of extra money, paid a private coach to look at my kata, private lessons, things like that, and learn from my experiences. Uh, as I went to every single tournament and then talked to the competitors. I wasn't, there was no ego. I was willing, the person who won first place, introduce myself. How are you? Where are you from? I'd love to learn from you. Can you show me a thing or two? What'd you think of what I did? And I was willing to be open-minded and learn from the sport karate piece, knowing that that wasn't part of my training. And it was Dedication and sacrifice, you know, in your early 20s, you, you're all of your friends, they're going to happy hour, they're like going out and doing these things. And no, I'm at the dojo, I'm training, I'm going to the gym, like this was a little bit of a goal. And a lot of it was very self driven um, to get myself to that point. You know, you mentioned self dedication, sacrifice, those are incredible things. But the word I heard you say the most is goals. I think mm -hmm. you said it a lot of times. And so we're, we will go around the horn on this conversation, but for you, I want to start. How important is setting goals and how specific do you think um, you had to be or might you recommend one be when setting goals? Uh, so that that's an excellent question, you know, as an educator. Um, so myself, when I was in my 20s, um, I just knew I had, had a goal and I knew if I wrote it down and put it on the fridge and it was something I saw every single morning when I opened up to get the, the milk or whatever for the coffee, I would see it and it was a reminder. It was a little bit later on that I heard uh, like a, an expert tell me, if you really want something, if you want to achieve it, write it down. I went, oh, hmm. I, I, I already did that. And then now we all know that there are these um if you want to go and you want to chain it, it's, it has to be measurable. It has to be actionable. You have to be able to uh, plan for it. Uh, I didn't know that in my 20s. I just knew that this is what I wanted to do. And, you know, hindsight is 2020. If I knew what I knew now, 25 years ago, you know, maybe things would be different. I think we can all think those things. Um, but I just knew that that was something. And this is a big part of my life. I have always uh, set goals for myself. I'm not going to say uh, New Year's resolutions because it was never at New Year's. It was periodically. I would write down, I don't know, summer of 2008 goals. And they might have been five years goal. And it might have been make black belt in this, go to this tournament, and then figure out what I needed to do, what those next steps were. And so if I could give any uh, recommendations to anybody listening right now, is if you have a goal for yourself, make a plan for it. It's one thing to have a goal, but if you don't plan for it, it just becomes, for most people, I don't want to you know, squash anyone's dreams, but for most people, it becomes a lofty ideal. You have to plan for it. You can have this goal, but if you, what, what's your next step? I want to do this. I want to do that. Well, how are you going to get there? What are the small steps you are going to take along the way and understand that those small steps uh, need to be measurable so that you know you're making it? Um, love that. I'm, I'm not going to personally answer this question, but I do like, um, I, I have a dear friend in, in my 12-step recovery who always says a plan without a schedule is a hallucination. <laughs> and, uh, so you're seeing a lot of nodding along the way here. So we are going to go around the horn on this. So let's start with you, Sensei Dauphin. You know, you've won championships. So I'm going to ask you two separate questions and I'll ask everybody the same. What do you think it takes to be a champion versus not? And I do mean competitively. And what is the importance of goals? And what would you recommend in relation to those? So I can only speak for it. Like I'm not on Mount High. I'm just talking from my opinion and my experience when it comes to competing. Uh, other people have different experiences, but <clears throat> it's never... It's always a team. Even though you go out alone, you go out into the ring by yourself. You didn't get there by yourself. Mm -hmm. And so I guess, number one, you have to have the guts, the guts to do the training. Sometimes the training is way more brutal than the actual competition, right? It's way harder and mo way more difficult than actually getting in the ring and fighting or getting in the ring and doing the kata. I was never too nervous to do my kata for, you know, five judges if I have to do Iaido cuts, I, I get nervous still when I have to do them in front of Sensei Suino. You know, if I have to do Kata in front of Sensei Legacy, it still makes me nervous. So going to the dojo to practice your Kata in front of your teacher, that's challenging. You got to have the guts for that. Um, so, and I did it for myself, but I also did it for my club and I did it 
for my teacher. Right? So it wasn't, uh, I'm freezing up here because my computer wants to do an upgrade now at this particular <laughs> second. <laughs> Am I back yet? It's a little buzzy and pingy. Do you want us to come back to you, Sensei? Yeah, come. Okay, we're going to come back to Sensei Dolphin. Sensei Suino, let's go to you. You have won championships. So what do you think it takes for you to have won those things or another person in competition? And how important is goal setting and what should that look like? Or, or at least what should it look like for you? Uh... For me, uh, if I refer particularly to my EIDO championships while I was in Tokyo, I outworked everybody, uh, and not by a little bit, but by by a lot. Um, so obviously, putting in the work is important. Um, I'll echo 100% what Randy was saying. Um, I worshipped my EIDO teacher, and practicing EIDO in front of him was uh, it wasn't scary, but it was all encompassing. It, I had I put everything I had into those moments, and so like Randy, I could I could be in a competition, and it would be five hundred people in the room, and five judges or seven judges, and honestly, I disdained them. <laughs> I didn't care at all. I just cared about my teacher's opinion of me. Mm -hmm. So that probably helped me a lot because it's possible that if I was worried about them, I would have been nervous, right? But I never was nervous for them. I was always nervous for my teacher. Um. So what did I say? Hard, hard work, incredible hard work. You got to worship your teacher. As far as setting goals, I'm a, I'm a strange duck. Um, if I set goals too early in, in an exploration of a new activity, I lose interest in it. I'm not sure why. That's just me. Um, so what I do is I set vague goals, but I, I get deeply immersed in a process like learning EIDO or, you know, reinvesting in Goju Ryu 10 years ago. Uh, I just get immersed in the process. I just want to learn everything I can about it, train, 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 and then great things happen. Um, so for me, it's kind of inside out. I like to work. I like to get obsessive about things, and and when I do, you know, the results end up being good. But that's never why I start them. Thanks so much, um, Hanchi Legacy. What about you when it comes to winning competition? What do you think has allowed you to win? And what do you think uh, are the goal setting importances and, and recommendations, if you have any? Well, I agree with Katie there. You have to set goals, but uh, go, working from the inside, you have to create in your own mind visions of yourself winning, you know? Um, it, it allows you to do several things. You have to get built confidence from the inside. I'm speaking mainly of Kumite. Uh, I unfortunately was not very good at kata. Uh, you have to put that extra effort in. You have to push your limit all the time, all the time. And again, you know, uh, the thing I always used to tell Randy was um, the other guys out there, and he's trying to, or the other, the other persons out there, they're also trying. So it's not just always pushing your best that's trying to find out what the best is doing like she also mentioned so basically i think we're all going to run over that same way right on um i i actually do want to want to add one idea that came up for me during this and in anything i've been successful at including martial arts almost an unreasonable vision of myself uh like when it came to, let's say, acting, like nobody makes it in this career. And I was like, well, I will. And <laughs> we talked about who we'd want to fight in one show. And I think you remember I said Dan Henderson. I feel like that'd be a real good matchup. And not today, but I believe I could beat him. Not today, but I believe with the work in. Um, he's about my age. Now, am I right or wrong? I don't know. But I do know that I can see my hand getting raised. And I do think that I know a lot of people who can't picture that. And I don't think they're ready to start the training and put the goal on the fridge that day yet. I think what you're all talking about with inside out work, a little more needs to happen. And I also, as you all know, I'm a strong proponent of possibly a therapy unrelated where you, whatever that thing preventing you from believing you could be the best. Some of us do it through hard work. Some of us might need to unpack something. Anyways, I think an unreasonable vision of ourselves 
Um, we might be wrong, but I'm not sure I can win the thing without at least believing it first. Mm -hmm. um, Sensei Murphy, I want to come back to you before we do our intros. I want to stay a little on this topic, though, and we probably will go around the horn on this because you said something incredible, which is, well, there's champions trophies and then there's champions in life. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you, because we're all martial artists for life, not for trophies. And what do you consider to be a life champion? What, what, what in your eyes would make you or the people around you? Oh yeah. That person's a champion of life. It, that's a great question. And it's a hard call because that's such a personal perspective. Um, what is my identity as a champion for life is, um, living the martial way, uh, sticking to good values, uh, being that, uh, 2024 warrior, whatever that is, living to a code of conduct. Um, and for most of us in martial arts, that's, that's living the martial way. But also, um, there are people outside. I, I know I martial arts was not my only way of life. I played soccer, I swam, I've done other things. And I know dedicated soccer players. And they, they live to this code of being an athlete, like eating healthy and living a healthy lifestyle and promoting that. I know CrossFit athletes who do the same thing. So I, I think the champion of life is uh, a little bit of a broad umbrella, but it, I think it is those folks who have dedicated themselves to living a lifestyle that promotes positivity, that promotes healthiness, that promotes a, a piece of uh, um, goodwill. And, and kindness to others. Uh, I don't, I've never believed that to be a champion, you need a trophy. And then if you didn't have it, you weren't. Uh, I think there are sometimes these uh, unsung heroes. And I'm a big believer in that for a lot of our people uh, that I haven't even mentioned now, therefore they are unsung heroes. Uh, you know, uh, I think people who have a goal and a passion and a dedication, whatever that is, and they live a good life with a moral compass that's aligned to it and they dedicate themselves to that pursuit and the pursuit of how that helps um, themselves their small world the world beyond that etc so it's, my, that. it's a little esoteric but <laughs> we were we we at least try to be deep thinkers and we really appreciate that answer sensei Sweeno, let's start with you on this one what do you think would make somebody a champion independent of any tournaments or trophies well sensei katie shared a lot of ideas that i would echo um uh one is i think you live into your into your potential live into your potential mental physical or spiritual uh um and don't rest on your laurels or don't shy away from challenge. Another one is you lift others up. As you grow, you bring others up with you. Now, for some people, you know, if they're struggling, they're only going to be able to help themselves or, you know, the folks nearest them. But if folks do better and they have a little extra energy, a little extra money, a little extra time, they, uh, they should help a lot more people. So in my view, uh, a really, a champion of life is somebody who, lives not only for themselves, but also lives for the betterment of the world, uh, whether they be a martial artist or anything else. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Um, I want to chip in one idea here uh, before we go to Sensei Dauphin. Um, whatever version in my world, it's personal responsibility and accountability because I've never met anybody who I'd consider to be a champion who doesn't look at where they can change and grow, not what's wrong with those around them. Um, you might start with going, I'm frustrated with this person at work, but then going, how can I, in relation to them, assuming they won't change, better this situation? And for me, you know, you said that, Sensei, Katie, about, okay, I'm not going to change how good that person is today, but I can change how good I am relative to them by even help asking for their help. And whether it's martial arts or not, I've never seen anyone succeed without going, what is my shortcoming in this situation? It might start with a complaint. Mine usually does, but ultimately it comes back to great. Now that I know what's bugging me, what can I change about myself? Um, Sensei Dofan, I know your computer's back. So do you want to pick up at all about um, goal setting or championship? Or do you want to jump right into this question about um, what makes a champion outside the ring? Let's just pass that now. Um, the previous question. I think that uh, it's important and I goal setting is very important. I do it all the time. And I also... Um, 
I think you need to have a good team around you. And I was blessed to have great, a great instructor. Um, yeah. When I fought, <laughs> I always looked at people and thought, you didn't fight with Sense of Legacy like 15 times this week to have to, <laughs> like, right? So I was never standing in front of somebody thinking, I didn't have that fear there. They might beat me, but they weren't going to beat me up. So, um, uh, champion Sean to me, whether it's for a trophy or whatever, gives everything for their goal, like everything they got. And so when I say that, you know, we all saw a little Ravana who has some problems in his development. He gave every single thing he could possibly give to get his yellow belt. That kid's champion in my, in my books. And not only is he a champion for giving that, when he comes in here, he's the first, when he's a yellow belt, he's the first one helping a white belt, tie their belt properly, doing, trying to help them with their program and do things. That kid's a champion. Um, on this call, Mario's on this call, Mario Musso. That guy never let any excuses become reasons to not do something. Bad knees, that's just an excuse. Get your ass in the dojo and train. I live in, I going to be in Florida for two months. That's just an excuse. Sensei, can I have a zoom link? Can I pop into the classes and train in my garage? Um, okay. I'm in Barry's Bay. There's 60 feet of snow. I'm going to go outside in my winter coat and do my EIDO class. Um, every time he's home, I'm going to go down and get a private lesson with Sensei Legacy and try and make my stuff better. And Hey, I can't come to the tournament, but I want to sponsor five kids to be able to go to the tournament. That's a champion for me. Like a person like that is a champion of life. Thanks, Sensei Dofen. Hanchi Legacy, what do you consider someone to be a champion? Like, what's that like outside of either the ring or even the martial arts? Well, on another level, I guess, uh, when, as you're becoming a martial artist, you're running through, you know, you're you're making yourself better, but you also, I said this just not long ago, that you're raising the bar for my, mankind itself just by simply us individually making ourselves better. We're raising, we're raising that bar for humanity. And the other thing is, uh, in some cases, very much like police officers or uh, GIs, um, you you also have the ability and the responsibility of helping other persons. You know, mm -hmm. sometimes you you have to do some some pretty unbelievable things to people in the army. You know, like mm -hmm. of guns and they're destroying people. Police officer maybe saving this young person from whatever. Okay, so. Uh, I think on that level, I think on those levels are what martial artists really stand for. Thanks, Anchi Legacy. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Punch Kick Choke Chat. Uh, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe, hit that like. We're so glad you're with us, either live or watching us a bit later. If you're listening on that podcast, we uh, we hope you're driving safely, especially with all the weather going on around the world. And we hope you're enjoying this too. Um, but if you're here on the Zoom link tonight, that means you're a live part of our living history and we welcome your questions. Andre's gonna light up the button at the bottom in the chat. Boom, right there. So feather us your questions and we'll ask them for Sensei Katie Murphy. And I get to introduce, um, our co-hosts, Sensei Randy Dauphin, Sensei Nicholas Suino, and Hanchi Gary Legacy. And I just want to say, given how we started this show, these men are champions. And let's start with competition. They have all won competitions, and they've all done all the work, and they have all dedicated and sacrificed and made the goals. But outside of life, I don't call them senseis because they won a trophy however long ago or maybe recently. I call them champions because of how they carry themselves and the code by which they live. And uh, it's a code that I aspire to live by. And uh, it's a type of training I aspire to live by. So I just want to say thank you to them, but also shout out to them as part of my introduction that, you know, we're in the company of champions tonight and um, that's it. Sensei Dofa, how you doing? I'm good. And I'm excited to uh, say Katie, who she's a, 
22 time world champion in karate, a 15 time U S national champion and a 10 time New York state champion. Uh, she competed on the NASCA, CRAN, and NYT circuits, was a member of two U.S. national competition teams. Sensei Katie represented the United States at the World Games in Portugal, Spain, Canada, Austria, and Ireland, earning gold medals in traditional bow kata, traditional forms, and creative forms. Uh, she began her training in Gojuru in 1991 and has continued to study the art ever since. Over the past 15 years, Sensei Katie has expanded her martial arts journey, competing internationally, training in Shotokan, Kyokushin, and obtaining a rank in Judo and Krav Maga. She prefers the title Sensei Katie, not Sensei Murphy. So she prefers the title Sensei Katie uh, and trains in Kyokushin classes regularly at Fighting Spirit Karate or FSK and in Krav Maga at Krav Maga New York or KMNY. Uh, she teaches her Krav Maga classes regularly at FSK and runs self-defense and Krav-based uh, seminars locally and international martial arts festivals like Rendezvous Levy, where, where Sensei Suino and I met her in the ring when we all refereed together, and also at Capital Conquest, where Sensei Legacy has interacted with her and, and Sensei Benson. Um, but using her experiences, she now coaches and trains youth students for competition on the NASCA and New York tournament uh, league circuit. Uh, Sensei Katie Lee currently holds a fifth degree black belt in Gojuru, along with her level six instructor certification in Krav Maga. Um, we were talking before, she's mentioned already that she's an educator. Uh, we all value education on this call. Uh, Sensei Legacy always says the smartest martial artist is the best martial artist. That's the one he wants in his dojo. And Sensei Katie is smart. She's a principal in a school. Uh, as I mentioned before, we met her in Levy, Quebec at the WKF World Convention, where Sensei Suino and Sensei Katie and I refereed together some divisions. Uh, and then we did it again this year at Capital Conquest. I was very excited to see that we were we were put back together. We must have done a good job the first time. So they they put us back together the second time. Um, I could tell instantly when I met uh, Sensei Katie that she knew her way around martial arts. She was a high level martial artist and also the tournament scene because the rules that were given to us, we both kind of looked at each other and we're like, this is a little weird. And then we just kind of changed them on the fly for the way we wanted it to be and it worked out perfectly our scores were all very aligned we never never really talked about scores like they said like talk to each other to figure out we just threw the scores up and they were the same she called really clean points uh i could tell she expected the competitors to be athletic with, with clean technique and their katas to be clean and well performed um I also will say she is very in demand as an instructor. Um, when you're at Capital Conquest, her mat is full and it doesn't matter who else is on the floor. Like the other names, she draws just as many people to her mat as the other names. Her, her mat is always packed. Um, in conversation, it's really clear that she's a lifetime martial artist. She's gonna be doing this forever. Um, she has experience. She has well-organized thoughts based on her training and teaching and education. And she's not just talk. She's not just talk. And I would say that she's a very bright light um, in a martial arts world. And I'm really happy we now know each other. And I'm really happy to keep working on our friendship and developing that friendship. So thank you so much, Sensei Katie, for coming on here tonight. Really excited to talk with you tonight. Thank you so much. I mean, what an amazing and humbling introduction. Um, I just do this because I love it. So <laughs> thank you, Sensei Dolphin. Thanks, Sensei Katie. So let's jump right in. Um, what was it like for you growing up and what brought you into your first martial arts club? So I've had a little time to think about this. And my answer is not, I think, what everyone would expect. So I, I love that I get to share something a little bit different. Uh, when I was uh, seven years old, I was taken to uh, the Nutcracker Ballet at the local theater. And I told my parents, I want to be a ballet dancer. So they signed me up at the local dance school up the road. And I started taking ballet. And I actually did that for five years. Uh, and about year four into five, apparently the teacher, unbeknownst to me, had conversations with my mom uh, that I wasn't um, 
I was I was good. I was flexible. I had an athleticism and I could do all the moves correctly, but I couldn't follow music. And they were very concerned that I was tone deaf. And so therefore, I would not be advancing with my class to the competition level, to the point level, all of these things that, that matters when you're 11 years old as a girl in ballet. And when I heard that that was the case, I said, well, I'm quitting. Uh, my older brother, who was two years older than me, had started karate one year before. And he came home. And while I had practiced my ballet in the living room, he did his karate. And I would look at the karate and be like, I can do that better than you. Like, this is not <laughs> <laughs> And so when I heard I wasn't advancing with my class, and it was done very del delicately, of course. My parents were amazing at that sort of thing. Um, but, you know, you, you, this is not going to be for you. You need to think about it. I said, well, I'm going to do karate then. And my mom's immediate reaction was, and because she probably knew us as children, was um, you're not doing this to antagonize your brother. So no, you have to be able to do 50 sit-ups, like 10 push-ups, hold five pound bags of sugar out to the side in like long stance, you know, something like that. Otherwise, you're not going to be allowed to do it. You just can't do it. So I spent that summer getting ready and I proved to her I was ready to take karate. And it was just a little thing of like, my goal for karate was I didn't watch movies that inspired me. I didn't have someone who it was, I'm going to just do it better than my brother. That was it. It was, there was, that, that was the whole piece of it. So, uh, I signed up for karate, um, because I wasn't going to do dancing anymore and my flexibility, my ability to move, uh, in certain patterns without music was a beautiful thing for me because of the years of dancing take the music out of it, I could move. And the confidence that was built, um, the inspiration that was built, because I instantly stepped into it. I had the flexibility, I had the stretch, I could throw a kick up here, all of those things um, and, like gave me that confidence to keep going. And I loved uh, what later became, I found out as I went through my teens, that that athlete of me, I loved the hardcore piece of it. It was challenging. You came away at the end of the night, you were sweating. And I loved being able to boast that, you know, I did 50 push-ups tonight and you know, my brother did 30. So, you know, <laughs> so that was, that was a piece of, of my entry into the martial arts. Uh, my karate school, uh, we were not a professional karate school. This was a uh, community program, two nights a week at the community center. Uh, and so we did that, uh, growing up and, uh, which I think is informational to my, uh, conversation a little bit earlier was my school, because it wasn't, it was a community center de dedicated to teach some form of martial arts to students as they went up, um, it was not a competition school. It was just learn karate, learn the forms, learn the, the dojo sparring, learn this piece. It was very simple. So because it, it wasn't a competition school. The path I wound up taking was uh, very much independent later on. But my inspiration was uh, my older brother. Love that. Do you ever go back to that old uh, ballet teacher and go, 22-time world champion, bitch, including musical forms? I mean, I never thought of it much. People <laughs> ask me, how did, and the only time I ever think about it is when people say, how did you start? And I went, Oh yeah, that's yeah, that's how. So Sensei Katie, this is your show, not mine, but I did mm -hmm. nine years of ballet before karate. And uh, my teacher said, look, you're a nice dancer, but you don't you don't have what it takes. You're not gonna progress. So it's nice that you like it. And then when I hit age 18 and found karate, I had a it wasn't about my brother, but I had a very similar pivot. And uh I just when I first saw those caught on the demo night, I was like, aside from learning how to fight, wow, I have found my home. And yeah. it's been ever since. So I just want to say I can deeply relate to the beauty of transitioning from the one thing to the other classical art. Mm -hmm. uh, so to talk to us about that first school and about the fact that it was, you know, a classical dojo. Um, and you mentioned the word self-defense when you first brought it up uh, in the first conversation and, um, you know, what that was for you. And then what did make you go, but I do need to compete. I, I know we talked about how you got into it, but what made you go, okay, this is brilliant, but. Yeah. I mean, when I, like, I came up, it was a community program and 
I didn't know anything else. So this, this was my, my piece Tuesday, Thursday night at the community center it was actually the basketball gym in the, like the Millbrook town hall. You know, we had karate classes and I think one of my biggest, uh, how do I say accomplishments that I remember early on was I started off in the child's class, the child, the children's class went, I think from six to seven. And then the adult class went seven till, uh, you know, question mark, whenever they felt like ending. And by the time within one year, because I learned all the katas super fast and I picked it all up was being tapped on the shoulder and saying, you're allowed to stay for the adult class if your parents will let you. And I just felt I don't know. I felt like I won. Like, oh, that was amazing. And then I would do both classes. I would do the children's class and or the children teen class, all the workout, the, you know, the, the push-ups and the sit-ups. And I would do that again for the second class. And that was a big piece of what I felt was a sense of accomplishment coming up. What I also uh, loved about that. And, and again, didn't have uh, another lifestyle to compare that to was I was able to play soccer. I was able to swim. So I was able to pursue uh, different arts. And, you know, fast forward later on, there is a beauty to dedicating a, a young person to one idea and perfecting them and mastering them in that. But I also do believe in the whole child experience and that piece of it's important to do other things. Uh, to build your body up in other ways, to do different activities that strengthen your muscles and your bones and, and things like that. So I believe that those experience, experiences were uh, helpful for me. I felt like I lived a full life. Um, what got me into the competition, uh, I had been doing all these things. I played soccer, I swam. Uh, the whole college swimming scholarship didn't work out for me. Uh, and then once you graduate out of the under 18 soccer league, okay, what do you do next? So I, I started to dedicate myself more into the, uh, martial arts. And, you know, when you just, when my school was train, train, kata, the art, the, and please understand as I circle back around now, as I age, I'm like, there, there's a beauty to that art and that dedication. But in my early twenties, it's like, why do I keep doing this? Like I need a reason to show up three nights a week at a as a 23 year old and, and train this when my friends are doing other things. So, and that's just my personal piece. Everybody has a different goal. I needed uh, a goal to work towards. And that was uh, someone tapped me on the shoulder and said, you shouldn't pee. And once they said that, and I went to a tournament and I went, I have a reason and it upped my game in class. I worked harder. I trained harder. We're doing stance instead of slacking off a little bit. I was down in that stance. I did the extra mile. I went all of those extra pieces because I got a tournament in two weeks. I got a tournament in a month. And it, it was all that goal piece. And uh, that was a big piece of getting me through my 20s to understand the purpose of martial arts in my life. That's awesome. So you used a word that I think is really interesting accomplishment sense of accomplishment and obviously then the competition so we're going to start with you um mm -hmm. we'll talk a lot about competition but let's how important for a classical martial artist is some version of competition to you uh, as a classical martial artist it was important to me i've always believed that there are three pathways in a classical martial artist number one is the art and the lifestyle so for some people, it's understanding they aren't really dedicating themselves to that lifestyle, that nuance, learning the language, learning the culture behind it. There's a beautiful piece to it. For some people, it's the sport piece of it, that sense of competition, a goal or a purpose. And then for some people, it's self-defense. And I personally believe that's a continuum. Initially for me, it was sport. Then it became a little more uh, self-defense and then you know, as we'll talk, I'm sure a little bit later, that got me into the Krav Maga piece of what I do. And then now I'm beginning to circle back around to that art, that culture, that lifestyle piece of it. Uh, and again, my interpretation of it. But I think, I do believe that martial arts, for people who embrace it as a lifestyle and do it for a long time, has a continuum. And you may be at different pieces, uh, at different points, at different times in your life. And that's okay. And how you want to dive in and how you want to understand those pieces, I believe is in, is is a personal piece. And it's important to you and probably important to your instructors and important to your journey. 
Thanks, Sensei. Sensei Dolphin, let's start with you. Even before I ask the follow-up question, she mentioned, you know, needing to to test herself in competition. I saw you nodding a little bit. How important do you think competition is for someone who's following a classical martial arts path? Uh, well, I'm not sure 100% how to answer that question. Like when it's classical, classical doesn't, you're not required to compete when it's a classical art. Like the classical art is supposed to build you for something different. Uh, it's supposed to build your mind and your body um, for something different. Competition can help build that. Like I, I would say that competition can be a foundational piece of a classical martial artist, but I don't think you have to compete to be a classical martial artist, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and I think, you know, uh, Sensei Katie already said it, like there's lots of black belts that are in legacy Shura and Ru that have never competed and they'll kick your ass, man. Like you're going to, you're going to get the beating of a lifetime. If you, whether, whatever trophies or medals you won. Right. So, but the competition thing, I don't know, for me, it was all very exciting. Uh, like part of it was exciting. It's fun to get on a plane with your teacher and your country's flag on your back and fly to another country and not know who if they're not on the circuit, the person you're going to fight, you don't know, like it could be anybody. Like, so there's a little bit of having to overcome the unknown when you're competing. Um, you know, I would say you have to really hone in on certain elements of your martial arts. Whereas classical is like a lot more broad. You're trying to be good at a tournament sparring has a rule set and you're trying to get really good within that rule set. Classical martial arts doesn't have a rule set. So that's what I say when I say it's hard to answer that question, but I, you know, me, uh, every martial art I've ever done, I've always competed in. Uh, and mostly I competed because I wanted to say thank you to my teachers for training me. That's why I did Yaido competitions. That's why I did karate tournaments. And that's why at 51 years old, I decided to do BJJ tournaments, right? Cause I want to say thank you to the people who've trained me so they can see it. So that's that's one and two i like feeling uncomfortable and it gets harder and harder mm -hmm. to find spots where you feel uncomfortable as you get better and better at something it's harder to find places where you feel uncomfortable in that realm and i think competition will help people with that and like sensei katie said hey it does change your mindset the second you you say you articulate i'm going to compete on this day your whole mind shifts. You come to the dojo, you train with just a little more intensity. You train a little more specific, like it just changes stuff. Right on. Thanks, Sensei Dauphin. Um, Three quick things I want to chip in. Um, One for me is that, you know, I haven't been in a lot of street fights. And so the one thing the tournament aspect gives me is go. Like you don't get to ease into it. You don't, the ref says go, it's on whether you're ready or not. And I like that because I hate it. Um, number two, and Sensei Dolphin, you just touched on this, but we all talk about martial arts as a lifestyle. And yeah, the second I'm competing, I eat better. I sleep better. I basically say no to other things. And so I don't believe the tournament's the be all end all, but I believe it engenders a deepening into the lifestyle. And lastly, one of my favorite Bruce Springsteen songs is called Badlands. And he's got this one sentence in it. And he says, I got to go out tonight. I got to find out what I got. And I love that. It just, every time I hear that line, I'm like, I got to, you get to go against another human who's trying to take that space, take that $5 medal. And sometimes we got to go out tonight and we got to find out what we got. And to me, competition is a pretty darn healthy way to do it compared to going out in Calgary and finding some dude who's in a bad mood. Um, Sensei Sweeno, let's go to you. Um, how important within a path of a classical man is competing? Well, as I've said many times on this show, I think pressure testing your martial art is critical. And if that's competition, that's great. Competition has rule sets. Like you, I sort of really get my act together when I have a goal like that, right? Oh, I'm going to compete in three months or I have to be on stage in three months or something like that. It helps me pull all my tools together and work really hard over a concentrated period of time. But in the long term, <clears throat> let's say in judo, um, 
uh, you pressure test that by sparring with everybody in your dojo. And then you have guests and you spar with them. And as long as they're not going to, you know, really hurt you, it's good to be uncomfortable. It's good to have that apprehension, right? Or go to another dojo where they don't call you sensei and they're not, you know, even if my students are sincerely trying to kick my ass, there's a level of respect that they can't put aside, right? When I go to another dojo, you know, with Randy, we went in Tokyo a few months ago and we went to a BJJ dojo and those guys didn't want any of us to win. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't give a fuck about me as sensei. And that was fun, you know? Um, so, so to the extent that competition is a pressure testing arena, to me, I think it's necessary. Thanks, I did listen. Serena was in some guy's garden. He tied his belt for him. <laughs> <It's> so funny. <laughs> yeah, well, he was a schmuck. What can you do? <laughs> um, Hachi legacy uh, for a classical man or woman or person. How important is competing as part of that life? Well, I'd have to go along with Sensei Serena and say that uh, in order for you to help others, you have to understand what you're doing and train in a certain way. But I, I'm, I think I misunderstand originally your question. But the real challenge there, I think, lies within. Yeah, you have to be able to allow yourself to learn. You don't want to push and hurry everything. Martial arts is a, is a, a lifelong thing that you have to, people experience things at a different life. So uh, <laughs> people don't look at martial arts as a Zen, uh, being in a state of Zen. But, you know, uh, doing kata, et cetera, is really for you to understand that we're living in the now and that we need to make the best of ourselves now. Uh, competing with someone else is fun in the sport of karate or but you know when you do kata, there's a much a, a much deeper understanding of yourself and self discovery. So uh, I would say that the competition, and pardon me for saying this, because I competed as well, um, comes second to the actual classical classical art and bettering yourself. Again, you're just beating. All of life, when you talk about competition, and uh, I don't want to burst anybody's bubble, but perfection doesn't work. And how people beat other persons is by those people making mistakes, right? So it's a different type of mindset mm -hmm. to compete and to make yourself a greater, better individual. And don't kid yourself, it's a hell of a challenge. Especially mm -hmm. with me. like myself, who started off on a, the wrong side of the tracks, and all of a sudden, I try to make myself respected. Thanks, Hanchi. And you talk deeply about something that is actually a pivot to the next question I wanted to ask Sensei Katie. Sensei Katie, you know, when we look at your record, you've got state sparring championships, but you moved much more to Kata. Talk to us about the importance of kata and why that was something that you, you're obviously winning in the fighting and you go, mm, not so much. Let me focus more on this aspect. Um, talk about the importance of kata and the importance of kata to you, um, both as a competitor and as a classical martial artist. Uh, sure, absolutely. Um, let me just preface this with... Um... Uh, for those of you listening here tonight, uh, all of my uh, competition uh, came to a close in 2014. So there, there is a nice piece of uh, living through the the good times as I as I talk about these things from 10 years ago. Um, the importance of kata for me, uh, I, I'm not going to lie. Like some people have very esoteric answers for these things. I was just good at kata. I won. Mm. Okay, so do more kata. It wasn't uh, a piece of it. I mean, it, it, there wasn't a deep thought of like, oh, let me focus on this with deep conversations with sensei. Uh, I was good at kata. And I'm sure the ballet helped with that as I came up through the ranks and as I made black belt. Uh, that was my forte. 
uh, the nuance, the rhythm, the timing, the understanding of different movements, I was able to create my own identity in what I did. Uh, so therefore, open tournaments were a, a godsend for me. The crane circuit, that was a karate ratings of uh, North America. That was a uh, Rhode Island, Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, like the, the New England piece of that. Uh, NASCA was a big piece of that. So all of those open traditional pieces, if I were to go to a strictly Goju-Ru only tournament, might have received more criticism on how I interpreted my kata, my timing, my nuances, my breathing. Uh, I'm sure I would have gotten uh, more, way more critical feedback. The Because we were not a, a competition school, we did dojo sparring. You squared up in stance and you sparred. And since they said time and he decided who won. So much more of a continuous sparring mentality that later showed up in some of the tournaments I went to. So when I showed up to point sparring and squared up and everybody bladed up and bounced and, and did these high kicks, I was lost. That wasn't my style. That wasn't what I came up with. And I found myself struggling and I did try for a lot of years. Nope, I'll do all three divisions. I'll do weapon kind of, uh, sparring. That's what you're supposed to do. That's how you earn respect. Um, but then after a while, I really did, uh, after I got hurt at one tournament uh, where I dislocated a shoulder, I said to myself, uh, I'm not 14, I'm 26. Uh, and while that's not a very old age, uh, this can't keep happening. Like, this is not my avenue. Let's focus, instead of being a jack of all trades, let's be a master of one. Traditional kata, traditional weapons. I did dabble in creative weapons and creative forms, but I did a creative version of a traditional form, a creative version of a traditional weapon, uh, which did very well in 2012, 2013, 2014, maybe not so much now as those, um, uh, how do I say, it? those events have grown and evolved. Mm -hmm. um, so that was my, my, my journey into it. And uh, I'll end with this. So I, I decided to retire in 2014, um, all the years of soccer and karate, my knees, arthritis, uh, not great. So hitting those super low kibadachi stances uh, was getting harder and harder for me. And that level of training to be prepared for tournaments every other weekend. And I, I was working full time, so this was not my job. So leaving school, like rushing out of school, asking the principal for my way out. Like, can I just leave a little bit early? I got to get to an airport to fly out on a Friday night to be at a tournament on Saturday, compete all day, maybe Sunday morning, fly home Sunday, get home, grade papers, do my lesson plans, be at school ready the next morning. Like, that lifestyle uh, got old for me. However, the competition bug has hit me again. And for those of you in the World Kabuto Federation, um, in Europe, uh, it's it's not a thing in the United States, but in Europe, Krav Maga has competitions. And I have been in conversations with Hanchi Terian very recently about maybe the next World Kabuto Federation event, Capital Conquest, or if it's not this year, the year after, bringing in Krav Maga competition and bringing in my school and my students and hopefully me uh, to bring back that little uh, bug of competition. So uh, so while my I thought my competition days might have been over, there's like a little inspiration that has recently come about. Love it. Love it. Um we are going to get to your crop Maga for sure, but there's a couple things I want to talk about before we do your 10 questions. And then we'll, we'll go to that for sure. But you, it's, it's almost like this interview was scripted because now you're talking about weapons. And that's actually the next question I've written down is what are your weapons of choice? And in modern day, when we're not walking around with comma and bow staff and Psy, what is the importance of weapons? And we will go around the horn on that one. So let's start with you, Sensei Murphy. Oh, okay. Um, uh, my weapon of training in uh, the, my karate world was the bow. Uh, it, it, it felt right to me. Uh, it felt, uh, I'm a practical person. Uh, I'm a common sense person. And so to me, the bow staff was, this is a hiking staff. I hiked a lot. We grew up in the country out here. Uh, that felt normal. If I can use my hiking stick and move it around, if I needed to, that that felt great. Uh, because I trained in bow, it was in my car all of the time. Uh, 
you know, so that was a big piece of it. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you know, moving forward beyond that, I think Bo would be it. It was always wonderful. I love when I go to seminars to do a little seminar in Sai or do a seminar in um, Nunchaka. Th th those are great. Those are fun and interesting to me, but it might not be something that I readily have uh, nearby. Uh, I have in my basement, like, one bow staff after another from, you know, the six foot traditional to the five foot traditional to the six foot competition, the five foot competition. You know, I just have racks of, of bows in my basement. Uh, that's it. That's going to be bows. Uh, and then obviously in, in the Krav Maga piece, there, there is a big piece of more modern weaponry um, with the knife and the gun and the long gun and, and, uh, the, the training that's required for it, not only to defend it, but if you're going to learn to defend it, you also have to know about it and how to use it. And um, I'm not sure if this is the platform to get into that, but that is a um, a big piece of my current training right now. Right on. Let's go around the horn on this. Let's start with you, Sensei Suino. You are a weapons man through and through with all your other arts not being diminished by that. But how important is a classical weapon in modern day times and what are the benefits of training it? <laughs> my first impulse was to say that's a stupid question <laughs> <laughs> say it say it i'm a fallible host uh no it's a wonderful question but i'm not even sure i can answer it um uh holy shit um uh training with a sword is is half of who i am i don't understand what life would be like without it it has nothing to do with fighting and everything to do with fighting it doesn't inform anything it informs everything um man that sounds like a bunch of hokey stuff um <laughs> <laughs> i just absolutely love it i love swordsmanship um uh and if if i had to articulate it for somebody else i would say that that the requirements of being really good with the sword force you to really understand geometry physics mm -hmm. how to move your body how to maintain a good mindset. Um, the sword is an amplifier for your mistakes. It also rewards you when you do well. Um, if I were walking around with a sword and somebody attacked me um, and they were within 10 feet, I'm good. I've, I've got this. There's no, I don't have any worries. And no matter what their weapon is, unless it's a firearm, um, uh, gosh, I don't, I feel like I'm babbling. Um, it's it's the coolest thing ever. Everybody should do it. <laughs> well, you should babble more, Sensei, because that's a fucking great answer. And there's a lot to that. Sensei Dolphin, let's go to you next. What's the what's the benefit of weapons training, uh, old school weapons in a modern day? Well, I like all force multipliers, Sean. Uh, I like them all. I have them all. All force multipliers. I have them all. I train with all of them. In Okinawan weapons, uh, like Sensei Katie, I like the bow, but I also like commas. Bow and comma are the two um, Okinawan weapons that I really like. Like Sensei Suino, I've trained under Sensei Suino with a sword for 31 years. So if if you come in my house uninvited through a window and I can get my hands on a force multiplier, um the one that I'm going to get is never going to run out unless I run out and you're going to regret coming through that window. Um, uh, so, I mean, there's, I guess what I'm saying is there's practical benefits to defending yourself by using those, those types of weapons. They teach you how to move. For me, they put thoughts in your mind. Like you're not just moving the weapon around. You should be envisioning something often while you're moving that weapon around. Um, on that point, I guess I'd say something kind of funny. Sensei Suino once at a seminar was teaching and was talking about the joy of training uh, Eido. And he asked one of my students, do you feel the joy? And my student looked at him and said, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. And Sensei Suino said, well, what do you think about when you're moving that sword? <laughs> and the student said, I think about killing people. <laughs> and, and he said, oh, you're one of Sensei Dofen's students, aren't you? <laughs> right. So, so. Um, and I always say, listen, you think about killing bad people, not nice people, right? Like for a uh, good person, good weapons, bad person, bad weapons, right? So 
Love that. Before we go to Hanshi Legacy, I just want to throw out something. I think weapons are cool. Like when I got into martial arts, half the reason I loved it is because I was like, this is cool. And, you know, we talk about Santa Claus and the martial arts and myths around it that end up becoming actually realities that are better than the myth. But I like the idea that I can still look at a comma and go, those are cool. And the history is cool. And while that's not the only reason I would want to do martial arts, I love that it's still part of it for me 31 years later. Um, Hanchi Legacy, you're a weapons man. What do you think is the benefit of training something that, you know, might not be the most practical modern weapon? Uh, well, you know, um, the police use nightsticks. Uh, the army use rifles with bayonets on it. So uh, in a very strict self-defense sense, you may have to learn something like that, you know, if a bunch of people attack you and your girlfriend on the way to the show and they have knives, they're going to cut you up, you know, a stick on the ground, like a tombow or a branch or tear a piece off of the fence. There may be some wild outside reason you could use it. But uh, uh, the one thing I'll have to say is that, uh, and since it's, you know, I, I watch him all the time. I, I can doing his EI. All martial arts give you the internal benefits. Mm -hmm. So you may want to keep the outside part of you interested, but you will still all get the internal benefits, spirit, courage, you know. So it's just the outside, the weapons and that are just different ways of doing kata without weapon, building up the inside with the use of something else thanks hanchi and before we go to our 10 questions back to you sensei dofan yeah one other i think benefit uh, i hope we'll all agree with is that when you train with something if you're confronted by it you know the limitations of it and how it works so if somebody comes after you sensei katie with a bow she's going to know as they're walking towards her what that bow can do if they actually know how to use it like it's going to become really clear as they start to move towards you. Sensei Suino is going to know right away if somebody's got like a century uh, wall hanger and they, <laughs> they end up chopping hedges with it and they, <laughs> and right. And, and they're going to come after him with it. He's going to know right away. He'll, he'll know the limitations of that weapon and that person holding <clears throat> it. Love that. Thanks Sensei Dofa. Sensei Katie, it's time for your 10 questions. We sure. asked you as impulsively as you can, but then feel free to break open your answers as you wish. Sure. What is the most effective move in your martial arts arsenal? Verbalizing. That, that's using your voice. Back off, get away from me, leave me alone, like yelling, whatever you need to do. And whether that's to attract attention or whether that's to let people who have decided that this is the best thing to do is to film whatever might be happening in a self-defense piece or translate that back to key eye in your kata and your karate. Who is the most influential martial artist in your life? Uh, I have to say my my sensei, my first sensei. He's the one who made it fun. He made it interesting. He made me feel welcome. He made me feel uh, validated and confident. And um, I think, you know, while people have movie stars, for me, that was, why did I show up every Tuesday, Thursday night? Because I felt that this was the place to be. Great. What's his name? I might have missed it. I, I may not have brought it up. Uh, Sensei Tom Maloney, um, USA Goju. Awesome. Nice to have those names out loud. Um, who is the most influential martial artist of all time and why? Oh, oh that's a great question. I'm, I might offend people. <laughs> um, yeah, I there are, there are amazing people. Um, old school, Chuck Norris, Bruce Lee, of course, UFC fighters. Um, I, I have to look internally, like in my life, what was the most influential person for me? I, I can't speak to systems because you can argue that left and right. And I'm going to say, honestly, that that's my husband. Uh, he may have not have had the same path I had, but um, I was exploring my journey of competition when I met him and he was a martial artist and he was like, in, and, you know, you all know this uh, in your own lives. When you have a partner in your life who does martial arts, life is easier. And uh, when I met my 
husband, as a person and uh, dating, my life became easier because I'm going to karate. I'm doing this. I'm doing this. No questions asked. It's not a problem. And for me, that was, and he does his own thing and I do my thing. And um, for me, that's just looking at him, like what his dedication is, what his inspiration is, was influential to me to be like, this is a lifestyle. We can make this happen as adults as we go forward um, because this is this is going to be our life. Right on. What excites you most about the next five years of your training? Uh, the, how deep can I get into Krav Maga training? Honestly, it's become my next thing. Uh, my, my karate, my martial, my deep Japanese martial arts, judo, kyokushin, uh, shotokan, gojiru will always be there. I, I will always do that. Uh, but I'm really uh, looking forward to diving into what real world uh, self-defense can look like. Right on. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you get there? <laughs> wow, you worked hard. <laughs> <laughs> Sit back, have a cocktail. <laughs> I think a little recognition for the um, the sacrifices. That's it. And, and we all have them in, in many different ways. I get that. But um, just that little nod. Okay. Yeah, you did it. Right <laughs> Um, you, you touched on this earlier. Do you have a favorite film and television martial artist, even if they're not actually a world-class martial artist? I don't. I have two favorite films. One, Gladiator, Russell Crowe. I mean, come on. Um, uh, are you not entertained? Uh, but I, I, I am embarrassed to admit this. Uh, one of my first martial arts movies and I please, I hope you all don't cringe, was only the strong where I got introduced to Capoeira. My, and I see some eyebrows going up and I was like, that's really cool stuff. Cheesy movie, but that's really cool stuff. And that was a big part of like, for me, the time that I watched it, I might've been like 15, was like, there's more than just Goju Ru, like hardcore punch block, that there's a fluidity to martial arts Oh, and wait, there's other styles out there besides what I do. You know, understanding that the time I was 15 was in the early 90s before internet and social media. So the only thing you ever saw was movies. Right and on. And that fire hall training, that fire hall dojo, what a great dojo. <laughs> only strong. <laughs> Um, we cringe at no movies around here. We We all came in through some cheesy ass fucking awesome <laughs> shit. for real um is there a martial artist living or dead in all of recorded history that you'd like to train with the most uh, yeah wow i don't know uh, uh, i'm stumped i'm trying for words can i give you 10 <laughs> <laughs> sure um, rip them, rip them. yeah you know uh I think the answer, my answer for that, and then please, I, I hope anybody listening might not be offended, depends on my day, my mood, I wake up, what I feel like doing today. Um, uh, you know, I, if I could go back in time, I'd love to spend a day with Bruce Lee. Like, I, I hope nobody current is, is offended that I didn't pick them, but I would love to pick his brain. He had such a beautiful philosophy uh, about movement that my Japanese karate being, you know, a little bit hardcore, Krav Maga is very um, hardcore and forceful. I'd love a more intimate conversation about Be Like Water mm -hmm. and what that could look like for me. Amazing. Um, as far as offending goes, I don't think enough people offend enough people on this show. So go <laughs> for it. Um, you go for it. Um, if everyone in the world could have the greatest benefit you've gotten from martial arts, whether they train or not, what benefit would they be getting? Personal empowerment. I, I can't emphasize that enough, both as my role as a female in martial arts, but also as, you know, a school principal who deals with, you know, DASA, Dignity for All Students Act in the United States, and bullying, um, and in all of this piece, I I do believe that martial arts doesn't matter your style. I, like all of that encompassed, um, training that personal confidence, 
whether that comes from working out, that comes from taking martial arts classes, that com comes from learning how to move your body in an athletic way, learning how to defend yourself in some way. There, there is a personal empowerment piece for it. I did Japanese karate for a long, long time. And all of my, and I'm going to digress a little bit here. This is my, my question that I, I'll take off topic. Um, every uh, self-defense command, my upbringing was, okay, you know, okay, place the choke on the person. And you waited for sensei to say ski, and you made the defense. My first Krav Maga class, I was a second Don in Goju, so they allowed me into the advanced class. Oh, yeah, you have Black Belt and Karate. Okay, come to the advanced class. You don't need to come to the beginner class. You know how to stand and stance. You know how to punch and kick. And so then we we did all the punching, kicking, and workout piece, and they said, we're going to go to defenses. Do you know how to defend yourself from a choke? I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, I've done. I've, I've got a 1,000 defenses from chokes. I know all, you know, one through 17 choke defenses. Oh, great. Okay. And the... Um, find a partner. I found a girl about my size, my height. And okay, one person is going to go, the other one make the choke defense. And they just said, do what you know. And it was like, almost like they were testing me. And the girl walked up to me and choked me, like literally choked me. Like I couldn't breathe. There was no command. There was no ski. There was no us. There was no hajime. She choked me. And I went, oh, oh, oh wait, 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 stop. And I had to tap her and say, where was the command to go? Yeah. And that was my eye opener. I need to be better prepared. And she was like, that's not how we do things here. I'm going to choke you. You better defend it. And uh, so, you know, that, that, that was my little segue into um, that. So sorry well, if I digressed a little bit, but. God, no, don't be sorry at all. Like we said, expand those answers as much as you like. I think your cameras maybe tipped down a little from oh. the start. Awesome. Um, our last two questions come as a pair. What is your greatest achievement and what is your greatest regret? I feel like I haven't achieved my greatest achievement yet. <laughs> I, I, I honestly don't know if you're going to ask me what was my achievement this year. I'm not going to say greatest. This past summer, I finally, after 14 years of training in Krav Maga, made Black Belt. That was a, a long-term journey. It's not easy to get, uh, and it was a three-day test over a long weekend um, that definitely took a toll on my body. Uh, I'm not 25 anymore. Um, what would I hope to gain? I think if I can look back 30 years from now and say I never stopped, it doesn't matter whatever else happens between now and then, I'll pat myself on the back. I showed up to class, I trained, I worked out, I learned new things. I taught people. I shared my experiences with them. Uh, that for me would be an achievement. Greatest regret? Greatest regret. Um, sometimes, like, every once in a while, I wish I took that I don't say, I want to say it's a great regret, but every time I go to these martial arts seminars, and that's what I love about World Kabuto, but I also do these in, in other events in the area, is um, taking different seminars. Mm. I love martial arts. I love to learn. And where I live, we have Kyokushin, we have a little BJJ, we have my Krav Maga that I teach. There's a little judo, but that's it. I would love to learn Kali. I would love to learn Aedo. I would love to learn different arts and they're just not here. Uh, so whenever I go to seminars, I try to jump on the mats and take those little bit of classes, a little Kung Fu, a little Kali, especially if I'm at World Kabuto, if I can ever get in scholar classes, of course he always teaches when I teach, but um, I think, you know, one of my greatest regrets would be just simply, uh, how do I say it? Not winning the lottery so that I can have enough time to do more of this. <laughs> that's and, and that's not realistic. We all know this, but I just, I just wish there was more time to do more of it. I love that time is real. And you know, so many of our guests, including myself, our regrets revolve around how we could have spent our time versus how we did and can mm -hmm. really that. So Thank you for your 10 questions. 
Let's jump into this craft, my God. We have not talked about this much on the show. I'm not even sure we have it all. If we have, I wasn't on the shows. Um, talk to us about what you consider to be the primary differences between, let's say, Krav Maga and well-applied bunkai in a classical art and why you're so drawn to it. Uh, great questions. Uh, big differences. Uh, Krav Maga focuses on gross motor movements, not fine motor movements, and they focus on instinctual reactions. So Krav Maga is designed to be taught in, in boot camp in six months to eight months of training. So when you spread that out for a curriculum for everyday folks, you, you could be talking about three years. It's not something that you're going to master over 30 years. That's not to say you can't do Krav Maga for 30 years, but there are no finer points. Everything is big motor movements. Uh, and it's no disregard to uh, any of the martial arts that spend their time focusing on finer points, but their goal is we have to teach these people and we have to teach them how to do it quickly and do it uh, efficiently within a short period of time. So I love that piece of it. I love the piece of it that their goal is explosive reaction, an immediate attack and, attack, and that their goal is to escape. And, and that escape, looking for your exits, looking to turn and run, looking for how you're going to get out of the scenario was never a part of my karate training. It might have been other uh, folks in, in their dojo for sure, but uh, it was never mine. I never thought of that. I always thought, well, you make a nice high block, you make a nice long punch and you're good. But in, in Krav Maga, that's not the case. You maybe have to control that person. That person can try and take you down. It's 2024. People know takedowns. People know how to do things that they saw on UFC and watched a YouTube video on that didn't exist a long time ago. Uh, so that's a big piece of what I love about uh, Krav Maga. It's based on natural instinct. It's based on your natural response and it's gross motor movements. And I think, and it's not fancy. It can be sloppy at times. So as a pure martial artist before, there was definitely a piece of me that looked at it with a little bit of a lens of criticism. Like, ah, it looks a little sloppy, I'm not gonna say. But uh, once I got into it, I realized that uh, if I wanna look at what I said earlier, your martial arts lens, is it the art and culture of a pure martial arts from Korea, Japan, uh, uh, different countries. Is it sports karate or is it self-defense? Self-defense is not pretty. It's sloppy. And your goal is to escape and get out of the scenario. And wh whatever that looks like, you make that happen. Thanks so much. That's awesome. So I'm going to go around the horn, but I'm going to ask slightly different questions for each person based on things you said. Anchi Legacy, let's start with you. Um, she was talking about sloppy and I saw you connecting with that. And I remember years ago you saying, Real karate is not pretty. It's effective. And so I want to talk, ask you your thoughts on sloppy versus pretty and why maybe sloppy is important. Uh, one is like like street fighting. Uh, if you're a martial artist and you're street fighting, your, your techniques probably uh, uh, have better mechanics, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, the people do different things on the street. And whether it's side kicking somebody in the knee or kicking them in the groin, or stepping to the side to take them down, etc., it's it's not all pretty like they show you in classical arts. Classical arts have uh, have another purpose, like I was saying uh, earlier. But when you're in the street, you have to do what's necessary, and you're just better educated through the martial arts to do that. So. It can be anything. It can be a hook punch and it can be a kick in the groin. It can break in somebody's leg. Forehead and face. Yep. So you can say that again because we haven't talked enough about that probably. What to the face? Forehead to the face. To anything, like she says. When you're fighting, you do what's necessary. When we're doing karate, we're just uh, honing our skills a little bit. Right on. Thanks for that, Hanchi. Sensei Suino, where I want to go with you, and again, I'm picking up on your nods and excitement, is when she talked about modern day YouTube, UFC, there's an aspect to takedowns that your average person thinks they can do. And so you have to maybe contend with that. So where do you go with that in terms of 
classical arts and just knowing that people know all this stuff, including like trying to double leg or something. Yeah. Well, I don't know if it, if it's, uh, if it's about classical versus not classical, I think what it's about is that there's a ton of people trained in that stuff now, uh, some well-trained and some self-trained. Um, but I mean, I've talked to a lot of folks, martial artists, uh, police officers, military folks, and they're just contending with that, 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 you know, if you're a, a police officer and you break into a hotel room <clears throat> to arrest a drug dealer, he might be jacked and very skilled in BJJ, right? And you better be ready, and uh, uh, especially if you don't have an opportunity to train your firearm on them, or even if you do. So, um, you know, there's a vast difference between folks that are well trained in something, whatever it might be, and folks who are internet warriors, right, or YouTube experts. Uh, so, so there's kind of three parts to this. This issue that you asked about there's the highly trained martial artist let's say someone who's really good in bjj or judo i'm just going to go for the grappling world and then you've got the highly trained criminal or bad guy and then you've got the and then you've got the um the person who believes that they're good right that they're going to do well that they just see red and they're going to take out all everybody else um <laughs> and the the, the formula is different the formula is different um so It, it, but but it won't be the same as Hanshi said you know um you go into the you go into a bjj or judo dojo and you grapple on the ground the the ground is padded it's clean um your partner is not going to shove his fingers in your eye or up your nose he's not going to forehead you or elbow you or head butt you or grab your groin uh, but on the street i've had all of those things happen to me starting when i was seven years old or something six years old um uh, even before I started judo and they all suck and it's sloppy and it hurts and and it takes even highly trained martial artists into a space they're not comfortable with right anger fear uh loathing disgust it's a whole different game I, I love Anji's answer about how your trained martial artist is going to have better mechanics on the street uh, but they're not necessarily prepared for the the whole the whole picture Thanks for that. And then Sensei Dolphin, the little twist I want to put, and obviously comment on anything you want, but when she talked about, you know, high block returning, I really saw you nodding in relation to something more instinctive and, and mechanical. So where do you go with that idea of blending those worlds? Because one's necessary, but how do you bring it into the other world? I mean, there's the stuff you can do in the dojo against other people who are trained people. And if you can do refined techniques against them, you stand a better chance of doing them against other people as well. But I think the dojo sometimes can be the fantasy world. You're convincing yourself in here that, um, you know, cause you could do it in here. You're going to be able to do it on an icy sidewalk, that same thing. So I like to think about, uh, where people are in their journey on martial arts. You know, if you're 35 years in or 30 years in, and you've been to the war and you've seen stuff like you go ahead. I want, I want any street fighter to go and grab a hold of Patricia Borger and see what happens to you. Okay. Um, but I'll tell you what she's going to hit you with is a high percentage technique. That's going to work. She's not going to like try and levitate into the air and hit you with a jump spinning wheel kick. She's going to hit you with a high percentage technique. That's going to rock you, your world into like another stratosphere. Um, and I would, you know, the kiss principle, Sean, like, keep it simple, stupid, right? Like, um, and you've heard me say it over and over again. If you hit them, if you knee them, if you elbow them and you can get away, then you can. But if they come after you, what are you going to do? You fucking hit them again. And if they keep coming, you fucking hit them again and you keep hitting them again. And that has to be your mindset until it's all over and you can get away or they're not going to come after you anymore. <laughs> right? Um, that's my slant on it. And that's my take on it. Uh, again, it's your mind, right? When you're doing your techniques, what's going on in your mind? Are you just a little kid? Like, yeah, sensei wants me to do this. So I'm going to do it. Or are you thinking if somebody grabs me, I can, 
this high block is going to go under their chin and snap their head back like a Pez dispenser. Like, is that what you're thinking when you're doing it? Um, and, and that's where you are on your journey, right? That's why people don't want to mess around with people in any martial art who've done it for 20, 25, 30 years, right? Because um, they usually have deeper thoughts than somebody who's been a black belt for two years. Right on. Sure. Um, thanks, Sensei Dofan. Thanks for every, uh, all those comments. And then the last thing, like minute or less, Sensei Murphy, just because I really saw you connecting with Keep It Simple Stupid. And uh, before we go to around the horn and take it out, why do you nod and smile so much at that one? Well, I, I think it's important. I think that's important for maybe not for those of us here on the Zoom who have been doing martial arts our whole life. We've had the opportunity uh, to spend time perfecting what we do. And, and please understand that Krav Maga is not a criticism to martial arts. Their their goal is for all folks, all people that are involved. And it's, it's a, a very basic movement. Keep it simple. Basic movements, gross motor movements, big punches, big kicks, push the people away, escape, verbalize, all of that. Um, and I love that piece of it. And that's a goal for everybody who walks in my dojo. Those of you who want to stick around, you want to train this for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. Yes. Now let's get into the art of different things. And Krav Maga is known, it, it, it's not its own system. Amy Lichtenfeld developed it in the 40s and 50s as uh, the Israeli defense system was formed. And he stole a little bit from Judo, a little bit from Muay Thai, a little bit from Jiu Jitsu. And he took all of this to make it. Uh, and there's beauty to all of those pieces of it. And there's a deeper dive into all of those pieces of it. If you're just doing this for one year, you're not going to deep dive into it. If you're going to stick around, I encourage all of my students who, who train in Krav Maga, and many of them do the Kyokushin, they do the BJJ. Some of them came up to the World Kabuto. Like, go learn other things because it can only make it better. It adds to your toolbox. Um, and But I love that keep it simple from a self-defense piece. Keep it simple. Don't rely on some, like you said, jumping. I'm going to do a jumping flying triangle. That's never going to work in the grocery store parking lot. You know, pushing them away and, and a quick kick and, and using your voice and yelling. That's what's going to work. And that's simple. But you want to do a deep dive and learn the nuances of different things that you can do. There's a whole martial arts world behind everything that Krav Maga does. And I love that that piece of it. And I love that I have that background in the martial arts world that I can bring in. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. And I actually want to say thank you to Robert Shlumsky, Justin Shea, Andre Sedeshev, Alden Adair, Jesse Vlevito, Sydney Dauphin, Josh Kitchens, Christiana Landl, Daniel J. Holland, Dridi Guliani, and Stavros Tavrulius. I missed them last week, but they are the people who run the behind the scenes. We don't have a show without them. So thanks so much. And I do apologize for missing you last week. And next week we have Adam Grogan on the show, which we're really excited about. And we hope you tune in for that. And um, what we do, Sensei Katie, if you've seen the show, and I think you mentioned you had, is we go around the horn starting with Hanchi Legacy, and we just say a little bit about our time with you, and then the last word will go to you. Hanchi Legacy, what do you want to say about our night? Oh, it was a great night. It was nice to hear about all your uh, your um, your tournaments and all your winnings and that. Like, not many people really get to move around that much. I guess some do, but in my day. We didn't have all that. Um, it was great to have you uh, as a guest. And hopefully next time I'm in Capital Conquest, we can uh, stop and talk a bit. Thanks for being a, a guest. Thanks, Hanchi. Sensei Suino, what do you want to say about our time tonight? Sensei Katie, this is so much fun. I cannot believe how fast this went by. And I cannot believe you're a principal. That just messes with my head. Uh, I, can't, I, do, I don't know what that what those kids are going through. You got to be the best school principal on the planet. Um, this was <clears throat> this was super fun. I love hearing more about Krav Maga. I'll tell you one goofy story, and then I'll part ways. Is that about three years ago, some guy called my dojo, and he said, "Yeah, uh, I want to learn that Carva Mega stuff." <laughs> And I immediately thought he was pulling my leg. I come on. I go, I go, what did you just say? He goes, yeah, I want to learn Carve Omega. 
And I go, you mean Krav Maga, don't you? And he, go, and he goes, no. He goes, I see it right here. I'm reading it, reading it right here. It's Carva Mega. So I said, well, sir, I don't teach either one of those things, neither Krav Maga nor Carva Mega. So good luck to you. And I hope you find what you're looking for. <laughs> so that's what I got. I love the story. Can't wait to see you in uh, a Capital Conquest and in Levy. And uh, we'll train together. Thanks, Sensei Suino. Sensei Dofa? I write lots of notes, uh, Sensei Katie. I liked where we went about talking about champions right off the bat. Like, I really enjoyed that part of this conversation. Um, and you said something that I, I've said often. You have to live a martial way. And I believe that of you, that you do live a martial lifestyle. Um, I like the stuff you talked about with ballet. You've You've probably crossed paths with at least two of my daughters at these events, Sydney and Cheyenne, and they both did ballet for a really long time. And I think that's one of the reasons why they're so good at kata and they have such good facility for fighting. So, um, and Sensei Benson as well, like he's deceptively good at kicking and doing things because I'm sure it's because of his ballet training and the, the flexibility. Um, I like that. You watched your brother in the living room and said, I can do it better than you. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I wonder, is your brother still doing karate? So great question. I hope he's not listening. Uh, no, he gave it up around um, 16, 17. Um, wasn't for him. But later in life, uh, he recently picked it up about two years ago. And uh, now we have an adult uh, relationship that is normal. and. Um, he has asked me to send him a lot of videos and things and he's working his belts up and he's very proud of the fact that he's back into it and he's, he's awesome. into it. So. But if he's watching, you are right. You're way better at it than him now. You're way better. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like your 10 questions, right? Verbalizing, most effective. Um, I agree with that. Uh, most influential for you is your sensei. Why, why wouldn't it be that person? And of all time, your husband, that's great. And you are right. Uh, my wife is on the call and it's she's a martial artist and it's much better when you're doing this stuff together. Conversation at home is better. Training is better. Eating dinner together is better. It's just all better when you can share that. Um, I think it's cool that you're you're jazzing out on Krav, Krav Maga. That, that next five years, you want to dig deeper into that. That's awesome. Um, you said... God, you worked hard. Sit back and have a cocktail. I'm in since Sweeno and I are into 75 hard. It's gonna be March 24th, and then God's gonna let me sit back and have a cocktail on that day. <laughs> <laughs> I love Gladiator, the movie Gladiator, and I love the movie Only the Strong. Those are great movies. As a matter of fact, my BJJ coaches, when they say we're gonna to go to Brazil, I'm like, I want to go to Brazil. And they're like, we'll go to this gym and this gym. I'm like, I want to go do capoeira. If we go to Brazil, <laughs> I want to go do capoeira. So um, personal empowerment, greatest benefit. I like that you said that uh, your greatest achievement hasn't happened yet. And it's going to be that you can just stay in this type of a lifestyle. And congratulations on your black belt, by the way. Congratulations on getting your black belt in Krav Maga. Um, I learned a lot about uh, Krav Maga just through that last little bit. I didn't know much about it other than what you see on YouTube. I do mm -hmm. have a really good friend who does it, Aubrey, but uh, yeah, I learned a lot. So I really appreciate you educating us and our community on this because I don't think we've had a, anybody on who's a Krav Maga expert. And I'll close by saying what I said at the beginning. Uh, since to Katie, I do really think you're a bright light in martial arts. Um, and I'm really happy to know you. I'm really proud you come on the show. And I know our paths are going to cross many, many times over the next 30 years. And I'm also very, very happy about that. So thank you so much for coming on tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so humbled to be invited to be a part of this. I, I, um, I love, I said this before, I love martial arts. I love what I do. This is my lifestyle. I have done this, the, the life of two, three, four nights a week. You're at a dojo is what I've known since I was about 10, 11 years old. If I were to, I don't know, give this up, I don't know what normal people do. What do you do <laughs> if you don't go to the dojo? 
Like I would be so bored. You come home every night and then what do you do? I don't know what, what other people do. So this is my lifestyle. I know that I will always do something. And I'm sure as I age, as you know, my knees and, and the arthritis and things like that kick in, there will be limitations. And I know that. And I, I'll never forget my sensei telling me one day, Katie, you will have to embrace the softer side one day. And I said, no, 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 I'll be hardcore Japanese forever. Um, but I was 20 and now I realize that, you know, maybe jujitsu is in my future. And then in 20 more years, maybe Tai Chi. Um, but I will never, this is my life. I'll never stop doing this. And what I hope if when my, my students come in and, and I meet different people, when I meet people who decide to take on martial arts at 20, at 30, at 40, it's a lifestyle change. And I can sympathize with them, but I can't empathize. I don't know what that's like. My whole life has always been, this is just what you do. I don't know what it, what it's like not, but I try to encourage them and, and try to make the lifestyle piece of what we do in the dojo, a social experience. I've heard from other um, members on the podcast talk about a brotherhood or a sisterhood. All of my friends in my social life, we didn't talk about this tonight, they're at the dojo. Oh, somebody needs wood chopped this weekend. We're going to his house. Somebody needs a granite countertop put in. We're going to his house. Uh, we're doing these things. Sometimes after class one night, we all bring seltzers and we sit around and we talk. Uh, and we do we do these things that create a bond in the dojo, in, in even if it's Kravanga or the Friday night, whatever. These pieces are important. And it's important to creating that uh, lifestyle that is who you are and how you live your life and how you embody what it is that you're going through. So I'm I'm so thankful and humbled that you asked me to share. And I know these are just small snippets of me, but um, we didn't get to talk much about my principalship and how that applies. Uh, so I'll leave you with this, the greatest experience in my life. I've been in my school district 18 years and I'll never forget the one day a teacher came in, uh, I'm sorry, a student came into my classroom and he walked up to me, he was a small little ninth grade and he goes, I heard you're a ninja. And I just went, <laughs> it was the best experience ever. He was like, eyes wide open. And, uh, but, but, you know, this is just me and my life and, and, and who I am. So I appreciate being able to share it with everyone. We appreciate it. Thank you, Ninja. And uh, thank <laughs> you, Senses, for this tonight. And thank you, everybody, for watching. We're so happy you joined us. We'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Sensei Katie. Good night. Have a great night, everyone.